Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's presentation of Homegrown National Park with the one and only Doug Tallamy. My name is Catherine Bryla, and I am a team member of Sag Moraine Native Plant Community. We are, ooh, I went forward a slide that I didn't want to go forward. I'm missing a slide, sorry, everyone. Uh, we are happy to be partnering with the Illinois Monarch Project and the Brookfield Zoo uh, to bring a series of webinars called Partnerships for Pollinators. Uh, that and some in-person presentations this spring. Uh, we're really excited about this partnership to spread the word. The Illinois Monarch Project um, is an amazing state initiative in the state of Illinois, trying to help monarch butterflies thrive throughout Illinois by collaborating on conservation activities and encouraging engagement by public and private landowners across diverse urban and rural landscapes. You can find out more about the Illinois Monarch Project at illinoismonarchproject.org, and we will have the link for that in the chat. As I said, I'm from Sag Moraine Native Plant Community. Some of you might have been at, at some of our other webinars. Um, I'm also joined here behind the scenes tonight by Lexi Neubauer, Mary Gelder, Amanda McCash, and Claire Parkinson that are behind the scenes and helping us live stream this on YouTube as well as being on Zoom. Uh, Sag Moraine is dedicated to the restoration of life supporting habitat one plant at a time. We envision a future where native plants are embraced for their beauty and environmental impact, inspiring a grassroots movement towards responsible stewardship of urban landscapes. To learn more about Sag Moraine, visit sagmoraine.org and we will put the link for that in the chat as well. And we are also partnering for this series with the Brookfield Zoo, anybody from the Chicago area knows about this great um, establishment. It's run by the Chicago Zoological Society, and their mission is to inspire conservation leadership by connecting people to wildlife and nature. And you can find out more about the Brookfield Zoo and visit the zoo at czs.org backslash Brookfield dash zoo. Now, our partnership. Uh, is going to include three spring webinars and an in-person event at the zoo uh, during pollinator week. But I just wanted to give a heads up about our next two webinars. Uh, the next one will be Why Monarchs Matter and How We Can Help. Uh, join us for this webinar on March 27th. That one will be at 7 p.m. Um, and then the following one will be the ins and outs of creating a native pollinator garden. I think everybody's going to be inspired after tonight's presentation to incorporate more native plants in your landscape. And if you want some points and tips on how to go about doing that, then join us on Wednesday, April 24th at 7 p.m. for that presentation. You can sign up for Zoom uh, again, on the sagmoraine.org website, or these will also be live streamed on YouTube. And because you're going to be so inspired to plant some native plants after tonight's presentation, I just want to give a heads up about our Sag Moraine third annual native plant sale, which will be taking place on Saturday, June 1st, from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Moraine Valley Community College in Palos Hills, Illinois. Um, we'll have thousands of plants available that day for individual purchase, but we also have a component of the plant sale that is, we have nine different plant packages with corresponding garden designs to make it easier for you to not only plant, but know how to plant and know what to put where and how far apart to put them. And for anybody attending the presentation tonight. If you do purchase one of those on our website, sagmoraine.org, put in the code at checkout TALAMI10 and you will receive 10% off of your package. With that, I am going to introduce the man of the hour, the one and only Doug Talamy. 
Doug Talamy is the T.A. Baker Professor of Agriculture in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. He has authored 106 research publications and chief among his research goals is to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. His books, Bringing Nature Home from 2007, The Living Landscape, co-authored with Rick Dark, 2014, The New York Times bestseller, Nature's Best Hope from 2020, and The Nature of Oaks in 2021, help the reader to see and appreciate the plants that surround them as they never have before. Ladies and gentlemen, Doug Talamy. Good evening, Mr. Talamy. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you very much, Catherine. I'm going to stop sharing and let you ride. Okay. Can you see me? Yes. Okay, good. Now I'm going to get rid of me. You know, I was looking at the opening slide there with me sitting there with my old hat on. Looks like I was contemplating how to save the world or some other heavy subject. I actually was watching my grandkids throw stones in a pond, wondering when they were going to finish. And my stepson took that picture. All right, forget about that. Let's talk about Hunger National Park, building networks for life. Before we do that, though, let me ask you what this is. It reminds me of a fecal sack. You know, when, when birds nest, they don't want their, their chicks pooping in the nest. So, uh, and mechanism has evolved. The, each chick puts all their poops in a little sack and the parents pick up the sack and they fly out and they they drop it and it just splats on a leaf. And that's what this looks like. Um, it's actually a spider. It's a bowl of spider trying to look like a fecal sack because nothing wants to eat a fecal sack. But at night, it looks like a real spider. It hangs from a leaf. It drops one strand of, of silk with one sticky glob of glue at the end there and then it goes hunting. Now, you wouldn't think that anything would fly into that one target. A web would be a better way to catch things, but things do fly in, they're moths. Uh, the spider quickly wraps up the moth into a tight little ball and then has a good meal. Then she cuts it free and goes hunting again. Then she catches another moth and she cuts that free, catches another moth. And when she's got enough energy, she uh, builds a, a um, an egg mass. This is the silken case of the egg mass. All the eggs are in there and that's how they spend the winter. And if she's caught a lot of moths, like this particular one did, she makes two or three egg masses uh, and you can find them all winter long. Well, the question is, why are moths flying into this sticky glob of glue? It's not an accident. She's releasing the sex pheromone of a particular species of moth. So all the moths that fly in here are males thinking she's a female. She is, but the wrong species. And I want to know what the species of moth was that uh, the bola spider in my yard was catching. So I unwound the little bodies that she, she cut loose and it turned out it's the bronze cutworm. And I've got bronze cutworm adult males because I've got bronze cutworm caterpillars. And I've got bronze cutworm caterpillars because I've got goldenrod, which is their primary host plant. We also have this beautiful moth, the dot line white, because I've got oak trees, particularly white oaks. They love white oaks. And because I don't rake the leaves from under those white oaks. There is a dot line white cocoon in this leaf litter uh, and you wouldn't see it. There it is right there, that white blob up close. No way you're gonna see that when you're raking leaves. So when you rake leaves, be, be mindful that you're actually throwing away an awful lot of living things. I've got evening primrose moths because I planted evening primrose. The moth did come and it spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers and sometimes it's crowded in there, but uh, you can bring them to your yard by planting evening primrose. I've got zebra swallowtails because I planted pawpaws. That is the host plant of, the only host plant of the caterpillar of that beautiful swallowtail. It would take me, I say a week, it would actually take me a long time to describe all of the species that are now calling my property home uh, because uh, Cindy and I have put the, the plants back. It wouldn't take me very long to describe what's happening in a typical residential landscape like this. Uh, there's no goldenrod, so there's no bronze cutworms, so there's no bola spiders. There's no oak trees, so there's no dot line whites. There's no evening primrose, so there's no evening primrose moth. There's no pawpaws, so there's no zebra swallowtails. There's very little that can make a living in a typical residential landscape. And we've got 135 million acres of typical residential landscapes in the US and we're not through. We're developing 800,000 new acres, developing, changing natural areas into residential landscapes every single year, which is one of the reasons we get to see headlines like this. 
The insect apocalypse this year, talking about global insect decline. North America's lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of our North American bird population already gone. Two thirds of Earth's wildlife is gone. 40% of, of Earth's plant species face extinction. The UN is predicting we're gonna lose a million species to extinction in the next 20 years. It's all very bad news, which is why Elizabeth Colbert gets to write this book, The Sixth Great Extinction. It's the sixth great extinction event that has ever occurred on planet Earth, but it's the first one to be caused by a living being, and that, of course, is us. Now, people are reacting to all this bad news about biodiversity, so much so that some people are actually studying what our reactions are. Richard Hobbs is one of those people, and he likens our response to biodiversity loss to the five stages of grief that we experience when we hear we have a terminal disease. First, there's denial, and we certainly see a lot of that around. Anger, I experience that sometimes. Bargaining, oh, maybe it's not so bad. Depression, feel that too. The final stage is acceptance. Uh, and in this case, acceptance is not an option. Giving up on nature is not an option uh, if we want to stay around on this planet. So we need a sixth stage. I'm going to propose action. There are things we can do to actually turn this around. Now, we do have parks. We do have preserves. They were established primarily because they were gorgeous places, um, exquisite scenery. As a matter of fact, Teddy Roosevelt had a lot to do with that. And this is what he said. The establishment of the National Park Service is justified by considerations of good administration. So Teddy was patting himself on the back, as he should, of the value of natural beauty as a national asset and of the effectiveness of outdoor life and recreation in the production of good citizenship. In other words, our parks were established because they were pretty places for us to play in. They were not established uh, primarily because of conservation. And that's probably why we only have 3.6% of the U.S. Uh, at this point in national parks. Only 12% is federally protected. Uh, compare that to Costa Rica. It's got, I don't know what the figure is, 25, 27% of their, their land mass is in national parks. But people still wonder, why aren't the parks that we do have why aren't they big enough to sustain the amount of biodiversity that humans need? And it's a good question. Uh, and there's several answers to it, but the, the, the most powerful one is that they are too small. When you take a large area like this and you shrink it down to a little, little patch, little, little uh, fragment of its former self, and that's, that's an exaggeration. You're taking large populations and shrinking them down to small populations. And that's the problem. Small populations are highly vulnerable to local extinction. Why? Because all populations fluctuate. In good times, they go up. In bad times, they go down. Even in your down cycle, if you're a large population, this top line here, you can increase quickly when times get better because there's enough individuals, no problem at all. But when you're a tiny population, often in your down cycle, you hit zero. You blink out of your little habitat patch, and then you're gone. And unless you recolonize that and picture a box turtle crossing a major highway, it just doesn't happen anymore. Then you're permanently gone. And studies all over the world are telling us the same thing. We have not preserved enough of the natural areas uh, on this planet to, to sustain the amount of nature that we need to sustain ourselves. And some of these studies are 100 years in length, so it's very good data. Now, we tend to use extinction as a metric of trouble. Uh, I don't think that's it doesn't make any sense to me. That's like going to the doctor when you're already dead. It's a little late. Uh, I think defaunation is a much better uh, explanation of what's happening, where you the abundance of species that used to be very common, the ones that actually ran our ecosystems, uh, have has actually declined. This, of course, is the American chestnut. It used to be the dominant tree in from Maine all the way to Georgia along the Appalachian Crest, um, really running the ecosystems of those those forests. And then we brought in the, the chestnut blight in. The, the tree is not extinct. There's still sprouts that come up from roots, but it is functionally extinct. It's no longer performing the roles it once did in our forests. The rusty patch bumblebee used to be one of the most common bees in North America. Today, if you find one, it's great, great news because they are so, so rare. They're on the brink of extinction, no longer performing their roles in their ecosystems. The American beaver. Now, you know, you can find beaver and they're around, but when, when, the European settlers came to North America. Beavers were so common, they had established the hydrology of the entire country. All of our streams and rivers were, were dominated by beavers, and, and the hydrology was very different then. 
Well, we trapped them all out, changed the hydrology, uh, and and now there's there's a few around. And whenever they act like a beaver, we we trap them out again. But the hydrology is still changed, and it's not for the better. So defoliation, the, the reduction in the abundance of species that run ecosystems, is the real problem. It's local. It's everywhere. I mean, think of the defoliation in your yard, and we tend not to even notice it. We don't notice it because of a, a phenomenon called shifting baseline. We tend to think that the way things were when we were kids is the way they've always been and the way they always will be, and it's normal. If you're born into a world that has been defaunated, uh, you think that's normal. None of us miss the passenger pigeon, which was the most common bird on the planet because it was extinct before any of us were born. So shifting baseline means that we're losing the biodiversity that sustains us and we don't even notice it. Edwin Waitiel, way back in the 50s, said, we cannot make the world uninhabitable for other forms of life and have it habitable for ourselves. It's, it's just so obvious. It's just plain common sense. So obvious that we don't see it. So what are we going to do? There are things we can do. And actually, there's, there's action starting to happen. Let's talk about the UN. They, they have recognized we've got a biodiversity crisis. They had a big meeting in Montreal, what, last year? to talk about the biodiversity crisis, to make some resolutions. That's what the UN does. Uh, here's a headline that came from, from that meeting. Crucial negotiations to protect biodiversity are moving at a snail's pace. We are negotiating whether or not we're going to protect what keeps us alive in this planet. Then we'll make a resolution and everybody will ignore it. I'm not gonna, you know, that's great that they're talking about it, but I'm not gonna wait for UN resolutions to, to try to fix this problem. What about E.O. Wilson though? He didn't, he's not gonna wait either. Of course, it's the late E.O. Wilson. He died uh, two years ago, the day after Christmas. Probably the most famous professor, uh, of, certainly of this century in, in, at Harvard. Uh, and one thing that was consistent throughout his extremely long career was his efforts to save life on planet Earth. Now, he loved it, but he wanted to save it not just because he loved it. He knew it was essential to our own survival. So in 2016, he wrote this book, Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life, and he had one simple message. If we're going to save life anywhere on planet Earth, we're going to have to save nature. We're going to have to save functioning ecosystems on at least half of the planet, or it will disappear everywhere, and that includes humans. It's a very bold statement, and he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that very bold statement. And then he ended the book. He didn't tell us a lot about how we were going to save nature on half of planet Earth. Of course, to a conservation biologist, that's a great idea. We'll just put half the Earth aside. And all those things that are in trouble can be in that half. We can be in the other half, and it'll be great. Problem is half of terrestrial Earth is already in some form of agriculture. I don't see that uh, diminishing anytime soon. And we've got 8 billion people and all of our hardscape roadways, airports, detritus in the other half. And we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. So how can we realize E.O. Wilson's dream? Well, I think we can. I'm sure we can. But we need a new approach to conservation to do that. We have got to give up the idea that humans and nature can't coexist. We can't be in the same place in the same time. That's been our, our, you know, our cultural motto for the last forever. But uh, it's not going to work in the future. Not only is living with nature an option, it is now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservation has worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head and practice conservation where there are a lot of people because that's pretty much everywhere. So we're not just going to practice conservation here. We're going to practice it here, but uh-oh, there's nothing to conserve here, which means we have to go beyond conservation. We have to move into restoration. We have to put nature back in order to save it. And that means we've got to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes. Not hang on by a thread, but thrive. So fragmentation has been noted as being the problem. We have diminished the, the patches of viable habitat uh, almost all over the place. Two tiny little, little habitat fragments. They're isolated from each other. They're small. Uh, and there's not that many of them. But the proposal to connect them with biological carters like this, so that plants and animals can move back and forth between those habitats, um, that, that's been proposed and, and it's, a, it's a good idea. The object is to um, allow inbreeding or, or to prevent inbreeding. So the plants and animals can move between habitats, breed with each other, and you won't get inbreeding depression. But there's a huge problem that remains. 
the actual viable habitat is still small. So the populations are still small. So when they fluctuate, they will still disappear over time. In other words, biological carters are not good enough. So let's expand them. Let's start to fill in the blanks. This is no man's land in between here. Let's put the plants back that actually establish viable habitats. This is better. This is even better. The lighter areas, of course, will be our cities and, and uh, you know much of our farming. But what's this? This is all our private property. We're going to put the plants back on our private property, which means we need a new attitude about property rights. You know, right now we all have this idea that we can own a piece of the earth and, you know, that this is our castle and we're the king and we can do whatever we want with it. The problem is our yards are not like Las Vegas. You all know that what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Some of you know that really well. But what happens on our properties does not stay on our properties. Every single thing we do in our properties impacts the ecosystem in which our, our property resides. Everybody's ecosystem is part of a, everybody's property is part of a local ecosystem. So for example, what happens if we decide to have a big lawn like this? It's going to determine whether rain infiltrates or whether it lose, leaves a stormwater runoff when you have a big rain event. It's going to determine how much you're polluting your local watershed with nitrogen and phosphorus and herbicides and insecticides, all of those things you put on a lawn like that. It's also gonna determine how much carbon you're adding to the atmosphere every time you mow. Not pulling out, but adding. It's gonna determine how well you're treating those pollinators. You know, a good lawn has no pollinator habitat. You've eliminated the resources that our pollinators need. Uh, it's also gonna determine whether you're actually pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, whether you're storing it on your property, on with plants like this, a big oak, for example, that not only is building its tissues out of carbon, but then pumping that extra carbon into the ground. Our plant choices that we, we put in our yards are gonna determine whether are harboring ecological tumors like calorie pear or Bradford pear that then escape and become major invasive species in our, our local ecosystems. It's also gonna determine how well we're supporting the food web. Are we using the plants that support the insects that allow other things to, to live in our, our yard? So in other words, how we landscape, how much lawn we have and our plant choices are all gonna determine how much life can, can be sustained around our property. Uh, and when we're talking about all of us, you're talking about how much life can be sustained on planet earth. And that is an awesome responsibility. And it's an awesome responsibility that homeowners don't even know they have. But it also creates a grassroots solution to the biodiversity crisis. There are millions of us out there. And if each one of us, if each one of us took our, our responsibilities of good earth stewardship seriously, we could turn this around. Where are we going to do it? Well, we got to talk about private property, all that land in between those, those parks and preserves. Um, most of the land is privately owned. 78% of the lower 48 states is privately owned, 85.6% east of the Mississippi privately owned. So if we don't do conservation on private property, we're going to fail. And that means collectively, property owners are now the hope in the future of conservation. Let's return to law and it's the low, low hanging fruit, the thing that we can modify the easiest and every year it grows. The figures up to about 44 million acres of lawn now uh, nationwide which is an area bigger than all of New England combined, dedicated to an ecological deadscape. Why do we do that? Well, we have to display our Halloween decorations, but we can cut that area of lawn in half. Now notice, I'm not saying get rid of the lawn, but let's cut that massive area in half. If each one of us cut it in half, uh, let's make the math simple. Let's say we got 40 million acres. We're going to cut that in half. That will give us 20 million acres that we can restore right at home, which is enough area to create what we're calling homegrown national park. And it will be big. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. And if all those parks still less than 20 million acres, homegrown national park will be the biggest park in the country. This is what it could look like. It's going to look like the country. But what you do, you go to our website, homegrownnationalpark.org, and register your property on the map. <clears throat> You're going to record where you are 
and the amount of area you're going to be a good steward of. Maybe you really are going to reduce the area of lawn. Maybe you're going to plant that bur oak. Maybe you're going to put an aster in a flower pot. Doesn't matter how small an effort, but uh, you're going to record that. And then your little piece of your county is going to light up with a firefly. And you get to see how many other fireflies are, are out there. Uh, and the object, of course, is to use this bit of, of social media to record our progress and motivate other people to get the entire country to light up because that's the ultimate goal. Our mission is very simple. We want to motivate millions of people to regenerate biodiversity by planting natives, removing invasives, and by doing so, reshaping our relationship with, with nature. This is our, where our current national parks are. So we want to turn this into that. Shouldn't be that hard. All right, what are we asking? We really are asking people to reduce the area of lawn. Lawn doesn't accomplish any of the ecological goals our yards need to accomplish, and we'll talk about them in a minute. And we want to put the plants that do accomplish those goals back, the important native plants uh, on our property. We want to remove any invasive plants that we have. Most people do have invasive plants on their property. They don't even know it. And if you are protecting any natural area with your land, you certainly want to keep doing that. There are real ecological products associated with homegrown national park, significant increase in biodiversity. Um, and, and I'll give you some examples of that in a few minutes. Measurable reduction in invasive species. If everybody got rid of the invasive just on their property, we'd be 78% done over the entire country. We'd be 85% done uh, in, in the East. Very good first step. We get a significant drawdown of atmospheric CO2. If you replace lawn with anything else, you're going to draw down more, more CO2 and help climate change. Uh, and you're also gonna, going to start to create viable habitat outside of, of parks and preserves. And any bit of conservation we do outside of a park is going to help conservation inside of the park. There are important sociological products too. National awareness, not just to what the problems are, but what the solutions are and what our roles in those solutions are. We wanna change the culture. We want people to recognize that nature's not optional. It's not there just for our entertainment. It's essential. It's essential for everybody, which means everybody owns responsibility to sustaining it. We want to convert hope into action. Hope is good, but action is even better. And we want to merge all of the, the uh, national conservation organizations, Audubon and National Wildlife Federation and Wild Ones and, and, and uh, SAG Moraine and, and all the land conservancy, everything, into one visual that we call the biodiversity map. This will be a, a record of successful conservation on private property throughout the country. Uh, and that makes it a record of how well we're doing towards this 30 by 30 initiative. There is no way we're going to save 30% of the U.S. by 2030 uh, if we don't include conservation on private property. So if we're going to insist on, on taking this and turning it into that, then we have to take that and turn it into that. It's not that hard. Homegrown National Park is free. We are in, supported entirely by your, your generosity, uh, which means whether or not we exist in the future depends entirely on your, your generosity. So thank you very much. There's urgency to enacting the homegrown national park solution. Remember those 135 million acres in residential landscape? It's a big job. It's a big job. So we all need to get to work and we all need to know what it is we have to do to succeed. Uh, well, there's four things that every property has to accomplish ecologically if we're going to achieve uh, some kind of sustainable relationship with the ecosystems that support us. Every property has to support a viable food web. Every property has to sequester carbon, store carbon, pull it out of the atmosphere and store it on the property. Every property has to manage the watershed in which it lies because every property lies in a watershed. This is one of my neighbors. He's destroying my watershed. He doesn't know it, but he's doing that. Every property has to support pollinators. Lawn accomplishes none of those goals, which is why we're focusing on that for starters. Plant choice. Plant choice matters. Plant choice is so important. The plants we populate our, our yards with uh, are, are going to determine how well the food web uh, is, is functioning. There are three kinds of plants out there. There are plants that actually add energy to the local food web. There are plants that do not add energy to the local food web. And there's plants that remove energy from the local food web. The very best contributor would be one of our oaks. 
Oaks are contributing more energy to local food webs than any other type of, of uh, plant, any other genus of plant, by far. A good example of a non-contributor would be a ginkgo, ginkgo biloba from Asia. You know, it's a nice ornamental plant, it's good fall color, but nothing eats a ginkgo. So it's not sharing any of its energy with uh, the local food web. And a good example of a detractor would be any of the invasive ornamentals we plant that then escape our yards, like bamboo here, like calorie pear, like burning bush, like buckthorn, like all of those guys. They're not passing on very much energy, but they are pushing out the plants that do. So the, the net result is a loss of energy from local food webs. We have to build a new appreciation for how important caterpillars are. You know, to the typical gardener, this is news. We've spent the last century killing every caterpillar we could see. Uh, but no, caterpillars are essential to local food webs. They are transferring more energy from those plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we build a landscape that won't support caterpillars, we're going to have a failed food web and eventually a failed ecosystem. Jan Jansen calls caterpillars the bread and butter of local ecosystems. And that's why keystone plants become so important when we're choosing plants to put back on our yard because they are supporting the most caterpillars. Remember what a keystone is. It's the stone in the middle of the Roman arch. And if you take that stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses because they are making most of that caterpillar food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So think of the keystone plants in the ecological house that you're building as the two by fours that hold up that house. They are the support system. Um, you can't build a house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do with our, our uh, non-native ornamentals for the last century. How do you find out what the best plants are where you live? You go to Native Plant Finder on the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code and the rank list of the most productive woody plant genera and herbaceous plant genera in your county will pop up. This is abbreviated list. I just ran out of room. So the old excuse of we don't know what to plant is just an excuse. Now, you do know what to plant. Um, just go to Native Plant Finder and check it out. E.O. Wilson, he is gone, but he, he left us with an awful lot of wonderful knowledge. One of the things he said was the little insects are the little things that, that run the world. Life as we know it depends on insects. We have to start taking that seriously and stop killing our insects. And we also have to, to appreciate that most of the insects that eat plants out there, the ones that are interacting with plants are what we call host plant specialists. They can only eat particular plants. As a matter of fact, 90% of our insects can only eat particular plants because they've got the adaptations that allow them to eat those particular plants. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to protect their tissues with nasty tasting chemicals. So it takes specialized enzymes and behaviors to get around those chemical defenses. And that takes a long period of evolutionary interactions with a particular plant lineage for all those adaptations to fall into place. Let's use the monarch butterfly as an example. You already know about monarchs. You already know we've got to save the monarch. You already know it's a gorgeous creature. And you already know it is a specialist, a host plant specialist on milkweeds. And you probably know that milkweeds are toxic plants. They're filled with cardiac glycosides. So don't decide to eat a lot of milkweeds. It will stop your heart. And they've got the sticky latex sap uh, that gives them their common name. When you break open a, a vein, all this white goo comes out. And when it's exposed to air, it gels. And if that gets on the mandibles of any insect that's eating milkweeds, it will glue their mouth shut. And then they starve to death. Well, monarchs have gotten around those defenses. They've got the enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify uh, cardiac glycosides. Uh, they also have the behavioral adaptations that block the flow of the sticky latex sap. And this is one of them right here. They can chew through the midrib of a leaf or they'll chew through or they'll chew through the petiole or they chew through the midrib farther down and block the flow of that sap so they can eat the leaf later on. Um, so those are the adaptations that allow milkweeds to eat or monarchs to eat milkweeds. The point I want to make here is that monarchs are not exceptions. 90% of the insects that eat plants have adaptations that allow them, them to eat specialized plants as well. So when we switch our plants out with plants from other continents, we lose all those specialized interactions and most of the insects. Has to become common knowledge that we need pollinators. And we're doing pretty well with this. We know we need pollinators. 
Uh, we've known this for, for a couple of decades now because of the decline of the, the honeybee. Uh, what we don't seem to know is that we need pollinators everywhere, not just in agriculture. You hear all the time that, that uh, every third bite, a third of our, our agricultural crops depend on pollinators. The actual figure is about a, is, is about a twelfth of our, our crops. Uh, and I hear people say, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't, I don't need any pollinators. Forget the crop argument. We need pollinators and we need them everywhere we need plants because they're pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. So losing our pollinators is simply not an option. We have to appreciate how important leaves are. We call them leaf litter. It should be, according to Jean Ponzi in St. Louis, it should be leaf largesse because they do such important things. Um, they, of course contain the nutrients that our trees used that summer, uh, those nutrients have to get back in the soil so the tree can use them again. When we rake away our leaves, we're, we're starving our trees to death. It also forms a blanket uh, over our, our the soil community. Um, there are more species that live in that soil community doing vital things uh, than live above the ground. Uh, and, and the leaves protect the humidity that all of those species need. Uh, so one of the things we worry about is that, well, if we leave the leaves on the ground, our plants will not be able to get through them. I stopped the car and took this picture. There was a big oak tree here, wonderful fern. I'm not going to call it a garden. I'm not going to call it a planting. It's a natural thing. It did it itself. Uh, and it, they came through that, that thick layer of oak leaves, no problem at, at all. Here's some of the things that live in one square meter of leaf litter, 250,000 mites, 100,000 springtails, little columbulins. Uh, 90,000 proturans, primitive insects, a million nematodes. Uh, and most of those guys are, are breaking down the leaves, returning the nutrients to the soil so that the mycorrhizae in the soil can then transfer it to the plants. Can we garden attractively with leaf litter on the ground? Of course we can. Our, you know, who was raking the leaves before we got here? Our plants are very good at getting through normal layers of, of leaf litter. If you pile it five feet thick, yes, it will smother what's underneath. But uh, normal layers, no, no problem. Here's um, wood poppies coming up at, at my house. I, I don't rake the leaves for two reasons. I'm not there to rake the leaves and I don't need to. They come right up. Here's what it looks like later on. Never touch the leaves there. They do just fine. We have to appreciate how deadly light pollution is to our, our insects. I just saw a, a talk from the Dart Skies people about all the problems that light pollution causes. Um, this is just one of them. So there are lots of good reasons to reduce our, our, our light impact at night. But um, here's an easy solution, at least in terms of killing insects. If we switched out our white bulbs for yellow bulbs, overnight we could reduce uh, the slaughter of insects at our lights because insects are not, nocturnal insects are not attracted to yellow wavelengths. So put in one of those yellow, they call them bug lights, uh, either uh, incandescent or or LED, and you will stop killing millions of insects in, at night. And if we all used in, uh, LEDs, we could save millions of dollars as well. Very simple solution here. Um, mosquito fogging, you know, this is a booming business around the country. Everybody hires their mosquito fogger to control mosquitoes. And they say, this is okay. What we're fogging is okay. Don't worry, because it is organic and it is uh, a natural product. And they're right on both counts. It's an organic natural product. It is made by, it's pyrethroids, made by chrysanthemums. But cyanide is a natural organic product. Ricin is a natural organic product. Nicotine is a natural organic product. Just because it's natural and organic does not mean it's not deadly. They also say it only kills mosquitoes. Uh, now, in this case, they're not even close to, to true. It kills all the insects, including the monarchs. You folks are trying to save the monarchs. You cannot do it with mosquito fogging. This is the result of, of a uh, fogging event on Kent Island in uh, the Chesapeake. My friend happened to be there. He picked up this handful of dead monarchs, but there were thousands of dead monarchs on the ground because it was right in the middle of, of migration. Uh, and it's killing all the pollinators that we're trying to save too. The interesting thing is, Mosquito fogging does not control mosquitoes because you're trying to control them in the adult stage. That doesn't work. You have to kill 90% of them to get good control in the adult stage. Uh, they only kill between 10 and 50%. So they're not getting good control. If you really want to control mosquitoes, hit them in the larval stage. Get a bucket, fill it full of water, put in a handful of straw or hay, 
that becomes, and then you put it out in the sun for, for uh, the population of diatoms and algae to build up in your bucket. That's what mosquito larvae eat. So this becomes an irresistible brew to anything that wants to eat uh, or, or to yeah, an irresistible brew to the mosquitoes, the female mosquitoes that are going to lay their eggs uh, in your yard. They'll preferentially lay them in your bucket. Then you go to the hardware store and you buy a sheet of mosquito dunks. That's $12 for a season's worth of control. This is Bacillus thuringiensis. It is a uh, natural bacterium that only kills aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is a mosquito larva. So you put in a, a, a dunk, uh, it's cheap, it works, particularly if everybody did it. We also have to appreciate the, the value, the conservation value of even small properties. Uh, and, and here's the, one of the best examples I know. This is Pam Carlson's uh, property. I think she might even be listening tonight in Chicago. You know, she is practically a budding O'Hare airport. She has one-tenth of an acre, three times smaller than the average lot size. Uh, and the next time somebody tells you you can't landscape attractively with native plants, go to Pam's house. She, she won't mind, right, Pam? But she's recorded 125 bird species that have used her yard because she put the plants back. She took out her non-natives and put in 60 species of native plants. Small properties can be really effective in conservation. And if you have no property, you can move to container gardening. We have a new section on our Homegrown National Park website uh, about container gardening. What plants are appropriate in the ecoregion in which you live that will do well in containers. Um, so many of our natives do, and they're very important for local pollinators, which are highly mobile. They can find those plants even if you're on the fifth story if everybody in an apartment complex filled their balcony with container plants, it would turn that apartment complex from a pile of stones into a productive resource for local insects, including the migrating monarch. They will nectar on it. Now, fortunately, we do have a silver bullet in our fight against both climate change and, and biodiversity crisis. We've got two crises on planet Earth. They both can be addressed in the same way. And that is the conservation works. This is the Natchusa grasslands. Uh, in, in Illinois, some of you probably know it, 3,800 acres, boasts more than 730 native plant species, 180 species of birds have been recorded there. It used to be a cornfield. Nature is really resilient. It's resilient at, at, at my house too, my, Cindy and my house. This is what uh, it looked like when we moved in in the year 2000. It was a 10 acre farm, part of a farm we got that had been broken up, been mowed for hay before we, we moved in. Uh, it was a very old farm, over 300 years, so the soil was exhausted. Uh, and by the time we actually moved in, um, there was nothing but invasive species. There were very, very few native plants. Because when you mow for hay in southeast Pennsylvania, which is where this is, you're mowing the rootstocks of autumn olive and multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and many others. So when you stop mowing, that's what comes back and that's what the 10 acres look like. Uh, it was an impossible tangle of Asian plants, mostly vines. So it's discouraging and people, a lot of people just want to give up, but I'll tell you, it is easier to get rid of than you think. You just get your wife to do it. And when she's finished, this is what it looks like. You put the plants back. Um, fortunately, she likes, likes doing it. So we haven't put all the plants back, but we've made a, a good start. Now, my research in the last, I don't know, two decades has demonstrated that if you know the number of species of moths in your local food web. Moths, not butterflies. Butterflies are bad tasting day flying moths, including the monarch, sorry. Um, moths, they're, the, that's, they're making the caterpillars that are running that, that food web. So if you know the number of species of moths, then you have a very good index of how uh, stable that food web is and how productive it is. In other words, how many other species is that, that food web supporting. So six years ago, I, I started taking a picture of every single, every species of moth I could find on my property. I am still at it. Gave it another try last night. And I'm up to 1,259 species of moths. So far, we are not done here. Now we have, we have uh, 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 29.4 million acres. So on one 2.9 millionth of the land mass, uh, we have recorded 48% of all the moths that occur in the in the entire state. It's just another indication of how resilient nature is. If you put the plants back, it will rebuild itself. 
And many of these are really cool things like the chinkapin leaf miner, the skull cap skeletonizer, the neighbor, they've got great names, the little devil, the horrid zaley, the forgotten frigid owlet. Ooh, what a name. The visitation moth, the obtuse yellow, the explicit arches, and yes, there's an implicit arches too. The snowy-shouldered eclaris, the grateful midget, the morbid owlet, the pink-shaded fern moth, the feeble grass moth, the scribbler, the lemon plagotus, the cynical Quaker, the showy admiral, the green marvel, Harris's three spot, the old wife underwing, the eyed pectes, the hog sphinx, the tufted bird dropping moth. Who wouldn't want the tufted bird dropping moth? This is my favorite, the spun glass caterpillar, and hundreds of other species have come to our property. And the first thing people say is, well, they're going to eat all your plants. You're not going to have any plants left. And I guess if nothing was eating these guys, that might be true. But everything is eating our, our caterpillars. How about those birds? You know, a single breeding bird will eat hundreds of caterpillars a day. That's one bird eating hundreds of caterpillars a day, bring them back to the nest. And we've got 62 species of birds that breed on our property because we've got the caterpillars that feed their babies. We've got bird food. We also have damsel bugs eating caterpillars. We've got assassin bugs eating caterpillars. We've got predatory stink bugs. This guy sat next to this aggregation of milkweed tussock moth and, and ate one every time he got hungry. It was a smaller aggregation by the time he got through. We've got uh, Polistes paper wasps eating lots of caterpillars. All those predatory wasps are eating caterpillars. Yellow jackets, bald-faced hornets, lots of caterpillars. We've got hymenopteran parasitoids laying their eggs in those caterpillars. We've got uh, wasps that sting the caterpillar, paralyze it, take it back to their, their mud nest, and then lay an egg on it. This is nature's form of refrigeration. If they had killed the caterpillar and taken it back and laid an egg on it, it would rot before the egg even hatched. But when it's paralyzed, it stays nice and fresh so that egg can hatch and the larva has good fresh meat to eat. And we've got vertebrates that eat, eat lots of insects like our skunks and our possums and our raccoons, foxes, 25% of a fox's diet is, is insects. And of course, we've got the amphibians that are insectivores like spring peepers, like uh, toads, like uh, salamanders, ringneck snakes, the cutest little gray tree frogs. They're actually green when they're young. Lots of things keeping the, the insect load in control on our property. But our lawn goals are too modest, folks. It's a great place to start, but we have to move beyond lawn because most of the privately owned land that's out there is in small woodlots. It's in cropland or it's in rangeland, 406 million acres of woods uh, belong to private citizens, not logging company, and they are being managed for lumber. So how you manage them for lumber and whether you, you control the invasive species load in them is going to determine their biodiversity value. We have organizations like the Foundation for Sustainable Forests in, in Western Pennsylvania telling us how we can manage our, our woodlots uh, in a sustainable way. There's two kinds of harvesting. You can you can do high grade harvesting where you take the best uh, logs, the best trees, uh, and leave the rest, and that gives you a great harvest once. Or you can do worse first, where you leave the best trees and take the other things. You have smaller harvests, more frequent harvests, but you can do it forever. Uh, you can harvest over indefinitely. So we know how to harvest uh, woodlots without destroying. Uh, their, their productivity. But how do we manage the invasive species that are in those woodlots? This is a, a park near me, White Clay Creek, Creek Park Preserve. Every bit of green you see there is an invasive plant from Asia. Multiflora rose, oriental bittersweet, Japanese sunny, they're all there. They're all escapees from our garden. And I know that because plants from Asia leaf out before, before plants from North America. So I took this picture in March uh, and and that's a big load. It's about a third of the, of the plant material in our parks are now from someplace else. Uh, why is that? Well, we brought the plants in, but we also allowed deer populations to explode. There's a tight linkage between deer overpopulation and the invasive species problem because the deer eat the native plants and leave the invasives. They won't touch the autumn olive. Uh, they won't touch the burning bush. They won't touch the barberry. So, but they eat every oak and everything else that pops up. So of course, all you have is the, the uh, invasives. In order to control invasives, we got to manage these guys too. I went to the Smoky Mountains last spring. And the first thing I noticed was that I have a good understory. That's what a healthy understory looks like. I hadn't seen one in, in, in a long time. So I asked them, how are you controlling your deer? 
And they said, we're not controlling our deer. You're not controlling your deer. Well, how do you have this, this wonderful understory? And he said, well, we have black bears, we have coyotes, and we have bobcats. And they are controlling your deer. They don't have any wolves, but it's still enough to keep the deer under control. These This understory is mostly canopy trees that are waiting for the big guys to, to die. This is what an understory looks like where I live. Uh, you've got no understory. You've got Japanese still grass on the ground. Every native that pops up, the deer clobber. They won't eat the Japanese still grass, by the way. Um, so when these trees die, there's nothing to replace them. That's what's the result of deer overpopulation is. There's another serious side, this downside to deer overpopulation. That, of course, is Lyme disease. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time in this, but I take it seriously. I've had Lyme disease five times, so it is real. So we've got to control our, our deer. And I know people get upset about this, but these are three options. Bring the predators back if you can. Sharpshooters, um, which people are hiring, uh, and they'll come in. They usually get about a third of the deer in your, your neighborhood, uh, and they're expensive, but a third is not good enough. Uh, and then you have to bring them back and back and back, so it's not a great option. Or market hunting. Um, Bern Blossie at Cornell is suggesting we move into this. Market hunting works. Look at how well it took out those pesky bison, those 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 uh, passenger pigeons, those those uh, Carolina parakeets. Psh, no problem at all. Market hunting can get rid of anything. Uh, it's got to be controlled, but it is an option. You get paid to hunt hunt the deer. What do you do in the meantime? You got to put a cage around your young plants, or you're not going to have them. It's that simple. Cropland got a lot of cropland. Four hundred ten million acres of cropland in the U.S. Uh, and the light green is there, it's distribution, a lot of cropland here. Um, and you might think there's not a lot of we could do to our, our cropland to increase its biodiversity value, but you would be wrong. There's plenty of things we can do. We can manage the roadside in a protect, pr productive way. We can put the hedgerows back, not everywhere, but in a lot of places. We can add prairie strips, great idea, and we can limit the use of neonicotinoid insecticides. We have lost the monarch because we have taken away their primary habitat, which was roadsides along agriculture. If we replace the weeds, which was milkweed and 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 uh, asters and goldenrod and, and uh, all the things that monarchs either eat or use for migration and replaced it with lawn, that we then have to mow and add more carbon to the atmosphere. Tens of thousands of, of miles of verges along agriculture has been turned into lawn just for status symbol. Uh, but look, we can reverse it. That's what they're doing in Iowa. They're doing it in different places. Uh, so if you if you know of any such programs, support them because that will put the resources back for the monarch, our native bees, and lots of other things. Put the hedgerows back too, wherever we can. Multi-species hedgerows of native plants. What happens when we allow non-natives to penetrate uh, one of our habitats? Well, we've measured that in terms of what happens to, to caterpillars. We went into hedgerows in Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Delaware and measured caterpillar populations when they were invaded with things like autumn olive and multiflora rose and compared them to the hedgerows that were not invaded at all. And we found a 68% reduction in the number of species of caterpillars, a 91% reduction in the abundance of caterpillars and a 96% reduction in the biomass, the, um, the amount of energy of caterpillars in those invaded hedgerows. If you think of this as bird food, when you allow non-natives to replace your natives, you have reduced bird food by 96%. It's a big hit. Prairie strips, what a great idea. You put pollinator strips, big healthy ones, right through the corn, right through the soybeans, perpendicular to the flow of water off the, the uh, cropland. Um, that reduces topsoil loss by 95% because it intercepts the topsoil. It reduces water pollution by 90% because it intercepts those, those nutrients. And of course, it supports the pollinators. And it's supported by USDA CREP uh, funding. So the farmers paid to do this. Everybody benefits. Uh, every single ag land out there ought to have healthy pollinator strips. And it's just a wonderful idea. And then finally, we've got to we've got to end our love affair with neonicotinoid, particularly the seed coatings, which aren't even counted as insecticides, by the way. They are 7,000 times more toxic to insects than DDT was. They're used preventively. In other words, whether or not we have an insect problem, we are putting this stuff on our, our seeds. 
And if you compare yield where you use them and yield where you don't, there's no increase in yield. So we are doing this for nothing. Only 5% of those neonicotinoids are taken up by the plant. 95% washes off into the watershed where it's very persistent or is blown away uh, on dust. And we have no idea what, what's happening with that. Um, so, you know, huge environmental impact. You know, these are, are banned in, in Europe already. Uh, they're being considered to be banned in places in New England. So we need to ban them everywhere. Then finally, rangeland. 770 million acres of, of our country are in rangeland. That's four and a half times the size of Texas, which is dedicated to cattle, but it does not have to be an ecological disaster. Our grasslands around the world co-evolved with grazers. That's what grasses do. That's why the meristems at the base of the plant because uh, the grazers selected for that over time. This is an experimental range in Nebraska that Cindy and I went to. Those are cattle, it's not bison. These are all sunflowers. Uh, this was a really productive place. All the breeding birds were there. All the grassland birds were there. The cattle were happy. It was not overgrazed. So we have to avoid overgrazing. And one way to do that is to put the beavers back, believe it or not, particularly in the Southwest where we trap them all out. And what happens when you remove a beaver? The, the streams that they had dammed up become incised. You get one of those, those monsoon rains and the water comes down and it deeply cuts them in, which lowers the water table which changes the Southwest. It used to be grasslands are now unproductive deserts because we've lowered the, the water table. But if you put the beavers back or put in beaver analog dams, uh, you can raise the water table again. Uh, and it becomes a, a much more productive habitat that cattle do much better on, will not overgraze uh, as, as easily. You also have to keep the cows out of those restored rangelands with, with fences because that's where the cottonwoods and the willows grow and the cows will eat all that. Um, and the cottonwoods and willows are, are really important plants for biodiversity. All right, there is something that's common to each one of these conservation approaches. And that is whether or not they succeed depends on decisions that you and I make. This is a sociological issue. It's not a scientific one anymore. Amanda Crandall, a student in one of my classes a few years ago, wrote this as part of a final exam. While conservationists claim to be managing species and habitats, what we're really managing is people. People. We need to change our adversarial relationship with nature to a collaborative one. Maybe it's not adversarial. Maybe it's just, just um, we just don't care, whatever that word is. Um, but we need to move to a collaborative one for sure. Well, we already said what Edmund Way Teal said, but the, the question is, can we do it? Can we do it? And I, I think we can do it. Of course we can do it. You don't have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. And people all over the, the planet are recognizing that the earth has some serious issues, but most people feel powerless. What can one person do? Well, we've talked about what one person can do. One person can shrink the lawn. One person can modify your lights. One person can add a pollinator garden. One person can remove invasive plants from their properties. One person can use keystone plants. Agriculture, you can put the, the hedgerows back. You can fix the verges. You can stop using neonicotinoids. We all can fire Mosquito Joe. There's lots of things one person can do to revitalize the ecosystem on their property. And that shrinks the problem to something manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the earth that you can, you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you start. And if you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy, help a park or preserve. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So I hope that Homegrown National Park will provide some motivation and guidance for millions of us, millions of us, to tackle these conservation challenges. Because whether or not we do now is going to determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own. And I want to leave you with the Homegrown National Park Challenge. I want each one of you this year to plant one keystone plant like this blue jay is going to do. It'll only it'll take you five minutes. And you might say, well, that's not going to be, it's not going to be a very big contribution. Well, I want 400,000 of you to, to do that. So plant one and then, then pass it on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And surprise, surprise, we got a ton of questions rolling in. I do want to ask you before we get to the questions though, 
Do you have Phragmites in New England? <laughs> yes, of course. Don't you love it? All everywhere. We've had it a lot longer than you. <laughs> We've had it 400 years. Oh my gosh. Once you once you start being able to um see or you know, know what 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 the invasive species are and you start seeing how they're all over, it's like, oh my God. And that's why absolutely just focus on what little area you can control. Right. Um Sorry, for some reason, my video keeps wanting to shut off. And I know everybody wants to see me so bad. Okay, I'm also helped here uh, to answer questions tonight by Lexi Neubauer. Uh, she's usually behind the scenes making everything run technically smooth, but I, but we're pulling her out in front for a while tonight. Um, okay, so our first question is, are you currently conducting studies on pollinator use of native versus non-native cultivars? I am not, but Mount Cuba Center at Hokesson, Delaware is. They have big trial gardens and they've been doing it for a couple of years now. Uh, and they're very good about posting their data. So go to the website for Mount Cuba Center. It's a, it's a native plant uh, um, landscape that was created by uh, Mrs. Lamont DuPont Copeland. So it's one of the old DuPont uh, properties. If you're ever in the East, you definitely want to visit that. Uh, but they've got all their results up there and they've looked at a lot of cultivars now. Uh, so that's the best source of, of information for that. What is your general consensus on that? Do you think there is? My general consensus is it depends on what the genetic trait was that was changed. We did do a study. It wasn't uh, uh, looking at, at flowers. It was looking at woody plants. The common cultivars there where you take a tall plant and you make it short or you enhance fall color or you change a leaf from green to purple, introduce disease resistance. We looked at six traits like that. And the only one that that um, diminished insect use was making a green leaf red or purple because that loads the leaf with anthocyanins, which are feeding deterrence. So um, you, that's one thing we could say, avoid the red leaf cultivars if you want to want to help nature. Um, Annie White at the University of, of Vermont has, has looked at pollinators. Uh, she has found that when you change a something in a flower, the size, the color, you're probably changing the UV spectrum and we don't, we can't even see that. When you change the nutritional quality of the pollen or the amount of nectar, you're interfering with the relationship between that plant and its specialist bees. A third of our, our 4,000 bee species can only reproduce in the pollen of particular plants. I'm going to sneeze. Oh, excuse me. Bless you. Bless you. Well, that pollen is making me sneeze. Um, so they're really tightly tuned in to the particulars of that, that flower they have specialized on. Um, now, it might not impact the generalist bees at all. And remember, this is a, this is a generalization. There's the one everybody talks about is, is Phlox paniculata jenna, which was a natural variant found in Georgia. It has twice the flowers as Phlox paniculata, the straight species. And guess what? It has twice the pollinators. So it's not black or white. It's not all cultivars are bad. It's It depends. And that's why Metcamp is doing the, the pollinator trials, because some of them are just fine. The one thing I don't like about cultivars that does go across the board is that they're propagated clonally, which means there's zero genetic variation. They want, want to do it clonally so they don't lose the genetic trait that's made them a popular cultivar. But we know loading the landscape with plants with no genetic variability is not a, not a good idea. So um, if we could, I'd love to be able to find a way to make cultivars with a lot of genetic variability, and then, then I wouldn't really have any big problem with it. So. Um, our next question is from Aaron. As our plant hardiness zones continue to shift due to climate change, what are your thoughts on assisted migration of native plants? Is it a good idea or a bad idea to install plants in our landscapes that may be native to counties further south, but not historically found in our own county? I'm not a big fan of assisted migration because... Yeah, over time, our hardiness zones are changing, but 
what's really happening with climate change is an increase in climate variability. Uh, we, we're getting more and more extremes, and that includes extreme cold events. So the, the, the jet streams going along, ugh, you know, you get these huge dips in the jet stream in the wintertime. They don't last very long, but we're still getting real cold events. And if we start moving plants up from the south, uh, they're not going to like it. Now, if you move them just one or two counties, uh, you know, maybe that's OK, because first of all, the insects that use them can easily follow them. But moving plants up from farther away than that removes them from the plants and insects that they have co-evolved with. So now you're putting them in a place where, where they're not going to function the way they, they would were in their, their home range. I think it's much better. And this is one of the reasons we want genetic variability out there is to let the plants adapt, give them the opportunity to adapt to all these crazy climate things we're throwing at them and just keep our fingers crossed and hope they can adapt. Remember, plants move around quite a bit on their own anyway. So a, a bird that eats a seed during migration and then flies 300 miles before it poops it out has moved that plant quite a ways, you know? So, so plants move back and forth more than we think they do. Let nature, this is a place where I'd let nature try to take its course. Okay, another um, great question. Uh, oh, sorry, cut you Oh, no, kid. go ahead, go um, ahead. If you have a small area, is it better to plant a small amount of a wide variety of native plants or create large groups of a small amount of native plants? This message comes from Donna in Chicagoland. Yeah, it's another great question. It probably depends on maybe what you're targeting. So for example, the monarch's a perfect example. If you have one or two ramets of monarch of, of milkweed and a whole bunch of other plants out there and the monarch comes and lays an egg on it or two or three eggs, they're going to strip them. It's not going to be enough to support even the the you know the reproduction of a single monarch. It is much better to have a a patch of milkweed, the bigger the better. Um on the other hand, there's a lot of good to, to talk about diversity. But again, if you're trying to help pollinators, uh, those specialist pollinators are going to go to that particular species of plant. And if you have a bunch of them, they don't have to go very far. It's very efficient pollinating. Uh, if you have one or two and then they've got to go a mile away to, to you know find somebody else's, uh, it's, it's not enough for them. So I guess in the long run, I would propose that you bunch plants more than than you go for diversity, but maybe get your neighbor to, to do the same thing with different plants. Don't think of your little yard as the entire ecosystem. It's too small, but think of your entire neighborhood. Maybe you can get to know your neighbors and actually coordinate things. So you can, over, over the foraging range of typical bees, you can have a lot of plant diversity, but you can't have a lot in a very small area. This is this is an interesting question from Sherry. Um, she bought her house 15 years ago in a wooded area, and, and she would like to turn her property into a more environmentally friendly piece of, of land. Um, she has a big lawn in the back, primarily because she has a septic system and the lawn covers the massive septic field. Can I and how can I turn at least half my lawn into natural garden with native plants without causing damage to the septic field? Well, I'm not a septic engineer, and I know that's they don't... not what I heard. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I know they don't want trees over a septic system because the roots will will they say will go down and, and damage it. But um, boy, it seems to me you can have have meadow plants. I know some of the prairie roots go deep too, but are they really going to wreck your cement septic system? I'd love to have that tested. There's an awful lot of, of uh, you know, misinformation out there. You should see what my septic field looks like. Uh, <laughs> I hope well, I'm that... just think, I'm just thinking like, like how, how deep does, does the, the, the septic go? I mean, like you have a list on your, on homegrown national park, of plants, native plants that do well in containers. So I would think that those are, have less, less deep. Right, right. Roots that maybe would be certainly safe. That's a good idea. We should make a list of shallow rooted prairie plants. You're only gonna make a note of that. That's a good idea. Um, and how deep is the drainage field? 
we always we always like say, oh, these deep roots, th th that's like a plus. And now it's like, oh, now we got to find what ones don't have the deep roots. <laughs> Good idea. Um, I, you know, if you look at my house, I have not followed that rule at all. I got all kinds of things growing over my my uh, drainage field and um, no problem so far. But, you know, a waterman will not recommend that. So. This next question comes from YouTube. How do you deal with invasive species without using herbicides? I am constantly doing battle with teasel. Well, that's why you're constantly doing battle with teasel. <laughs> Help me out with teasel. Is that an annual or is that a perennial? I think it's an annual that seeds itself. Okay. Well, that makes it really tough because that means you'd have to control it every single year until you get rid of the seed bank. Uh, and you're talking about a lot of, a lot of years there. Um, I've got Japanese stilt grass, same thing. Uh, it's an annual. And unless you spray the world, you, you can't control it. And I'm not going to spray the world. Uh, so, so far Japanese stilt grass has, has beaten me. Um, teasel would be a tough one. It depends on the big, the size of the area you have. But um, you can, I know what Larry Weiner would suggest. He'd suggest going out there with clippers and hand, hand clipping them when they're young two or three times. And you exhaust that, that annual root system, which is not very big. Um, and you wouldn't have to use herbicides. Of course, it's much easier to use herbicides. Uh, but uh, then you're hitting all the non-targets, all the things that's growing up with the, the teasels. There, th this is the downside of a, a Q and A is that we've got some really tough problems out there that don't have great solutions right now. But everybody expects me to have those great solutions. Invasive plants are bad. Let's not bring in any more. Yeah, I hear you. We got we got a you know what show going on out there, and it's like trying to trying to handle it. You know, um, mm -hmm. like Debbie said, um, she asked. She's got. An, an oak tree that is a bur oak tree that's coming up three feet from her house. And she doesn't, she doesn't want to kill it, but it's yeah. too big to be that close to her house. And she heard you talking in uh, somewhere about pruning an oak tree to keep it shrub size. Can you touch on that? Yeah, you can, you can turn it into a coppice, right? Um, so yeah, cut it off at the base and it'll come back as a shrub and you can do that for a hundred years. Uh, now, I'm sure the root system gets a little bigger each year, but I had the same problem. Blue jays have planted oaks right next to my house, and I have not been good at getting rid of them. I've got a pin oak that's, that's probably 50 feet tall now, and it's way too close to the house. So I didn't want to take it down either, but at some point we we have to. Uh, but that's a good idea. Coppice it. Cut it off at the base, and then they come back as as a shrub. You can do that with black cherry. There are a lot of, lot of deciduous trees that coppice very well. And so cut it off at the base once and then it comes off as a shrub and then just continue trimming it like a shrub. Give it a year, you know, two or three years as the shrub and then you're going to trim it back again. Yeah. Then you get this the is... foliage, which will support caterpillars. It's never going to make acorns for you, but it won't become a giant tree either. Oh, that's a great idea because a lot of us in the Chicago area, we just don't have the, uh, the yard size to support many oaks. Right, right. This is another great question. What are some simple talking points to start with neighbors to get them thinking? I have signs out. My yard looks very different than theirs. And I post things on the neighborhood Facebook, but would like to talk to them without them getting defensive. This comes from Nicole. It is very tough to go to your neighbor and tell them they're not living right. They should live like you. As nice as uh, approach as, as possible, it's still not going to go over well with most people. Um, one thing you can do is, and it sounds like you're doing it, is be a good model um, so that they can they can see, you know, what your neighbor is doing. They might not be thinking about it. They're simply following the culture. This is what I have to do to fit in. Um, but if they if you can show them an alternative that's not going to reduce property values, all the things that the homeowners association scares you about, uh, that it's attractive, that you actually have living things. This works better with neighbors who have kids, most neighbors who have kids, because the kids love nature. They love to find that butterfly and the other things. Um, but I don't know, sneak a, sneak a copy of my book in their mailbox and run. But... <laughs> 
it's the it's the major challenge. It, I've tried to been you know figure this out for the last twenty years, and depends on how well you know your neighbors. So, one thing you could do if you know them well is you know what here's an idea: invite that neighbor up and say, "I want to show you a video. Show them this talk tonight." So this is recorded, right? They can get it get a copy of this. Just a, just a thought. Then so you can I can't wait. You can blame it on me and not not you. Just I can't wait to ask you this one because I just I, I can already hear what you're going to say, but I'm going to ask it. True Green, that's a a lawn chemical company that is popular in this area, tells me that their mosquito spray is safe for caterpillars. Is this true? <laughs> no, <laughs> blatantly no. Um, get a caterpillar. And have them spray it next time they come and see what happens. You know, they're they're giving you the party line with no data at all. No. Blatantly misinformation, false advertising. Did you see that pile of dead monarchs out there? So there you go. This is another question about uh, mosquito dunks. Can you use mosquito dunks in rain barrels, which are then used to water plants and veggies? Um, I would, and veggies, well, yes, I mean, the, the, yes, you can, because the only thing that that bacterium is, is going to hurt is, a, excuse me, an aquatic dipterin. So it's not going to hurt your plants. It's not going to hurt your vegetables. Um, I know a lot of people are going to say, I don't want that on my vegetables. I'm going to eat my vegetables, but um, you can actually get another bucket and the mosquitoes will lay in that. <laughs> Remember your, your rain bar, you, 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 the mosquitoes will lay in that, but if you, you don't have organic material in there to attract them, your, your black bucket, if you put some, some organic, you know, leaves or straw or hay in there, it becomes more attractive to those ovipositing mosquitoes than the rain barrel, which is just empty water. Uh, so they ought to ov oviposit preferentially in the bucket but it's not toxic to anything else. So we have a few people that are asking questions and this is always, you know, a, an issue. Um, for example, this person is wondering how to approach our town to allow us to plant in the parkways. It's not our property. Technically it's city property. We also have a lot of you know, people watching that live in HOAs that battle them on this. Do you have any suggestions for people that are trying to awaken those around them? Yeah. Well, first of all, it is happening. There's, there's, uh, I always tell people to join your HOA, educate from within. And I'm getting emails back saying, hey, that works. You know, the, who's in your HOA? It's your neighbors. It, they're just people. They're people that are following rules that have been there. A lot of it's based on misinformation. Um, the, you can you can correct the misinformation. You can demonstrate that this type of landscaping is not going to reduce property values. You all can still be high high status, but they need it needs to be explained to them. Most of them don't know what a, a native or a non-native plant is, but they do know what messy is. Use lawn as a cue for care. Show them that you can have a lot less lawn, but it's going to be manicured. You get it what the 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 culture is. Uh, and then they they won't fight you on that. For for uh, you know township rules, you have to have a, a, a groundswell of of people who will write to the mayor, write to somebody, say, look, this these environmental issues are important to us, and if you don't give us action on it, we're not going to vote for you again. And believe me, you get action. They want to keep their job. They just don't think it's important enough to you. But elected officials will listen to the people who elect them if the people talk to them. Or roadside management, whatever. Give them, you know, give them the statistics. You're wasting a lot of money mowing that lawn, putting carbon in the atmosphere. It could be well planted where you only have to mow it once a year or once every two years. Well, along that line, Nicole asks a great question. What are some simple talking points to start with neighbors to get them thinking? Yeah. Um, and it's that that, so that they don't tune you out or get defensive. Yeah, it's that neighbor issue. I don't know. You know, if your neighbor really is using Mosquito Joe, say, did you know that just killed the monarchs in my yard? 
that usually wakes people up. Just just point out the misinformation. It really does kill the things you think it's not killing. You know, it kills all your pollinators. Most people get it. Pollinators are important. Most people like the monarch. They like butterflies. Show them a bunch of dead butterflies that their their lawn care industry just killed. That often gets their attention. Uh, speaking of killing things, what are your thoughts about washing aphids off of milkweed? Those aphids are oleander aphid. It's an invasive species from South America, I believe. Um, wash them off. Does planting um, some kind of like garlic or other plants like radishes help with um, aphids? Uh, there's uh, there are hypotheses out there that say that you can um, mask the signals that your milkweeds and other plants send to herbivores by having other companion plants around. I don't think it's ever been well demonstrated. It's certainly not going to hurt. It's worth a try, but don't be surprised if it doesn't work. Great. Is this just a U.S. problem of planting, you know, European and Asian plants here, or have other countries also been doing this to destroy their natural habitat? Everybody's doing it. Um, many of our native plants are highly invasive in Europe. Goldenrod, huge problem in Europe. They brought it over as an ornamental. Um, we've got invasive insects, the sycamore lace bug, which is normal, natural inhabitant of our sycamores is killing all the sycamores over in, in Europe. Um, the exchange hasn't been fair. We brought a lot more things here than given away things, but uh, it does work both ways. And can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, how can like you have sycamores here and a sycamore lace wing that you've been doing that, and it's, it doesn't destroy the, 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 the habitat here it's kept in check but if you take it there even though they have sycamores it gets out of control why why is that that balance um or is that a whole other webinar <laughs> yeah no that's a good it's a good question because we have moved the lace bug here which has a lot of natural enemies here to a place where it has no natural enemies uh, particularly parasitoids um so the that's you know all levels of the trophic system have things that control it. That's the problem with our deer. There's, our deer are nice little things, but we've taken away all the predators. So there's nothing to keep that population depressed below the carrying capacity. Same thing with the sycamore lace bug, same thing. Same thing with the, uh, you know, the goldenrod and all these other plants that we're moving around. We're moving them around without the things that keep them in check. In the mid-Atlantic states, there's 110 species of moths that eat goldenrod. It keeps it in check. Gotcha. Um, somebody asked about the, the jumping worms. Is that something that we should be very concerned with and on the lookout for? Jumping worms, jumping worms. They're invasive worms from Asia. Yes, you don't want jumping worms. Um, it's three species of invasive worms that... Um, they're annuals, so they overwinter is the little little brown seed case that you never see in the soil. Uh, and then they eat all of the leaf litter. They change the chemistry of the soil. They eat all the seeds in the soil. They they can really devastate that soil ecosystem. Uh, so uh, and nobody knows what to do about them. You don't if if you don't have them, that's great. This is why moving plants. If you buy a, a bald and burlap tree from a place that has jumping worms potential problem because there's no way you'll see, you might see, oh, there's no worms in there, but the egg cases can be in there and you never know it. And that's how they're being moved moved around. So uh, it is another huge problem from invasive species that we really do not have a handle on at all. The best thing you can do if you don't have them is don't bring them in. Um, here's another question. What what keystone plant species would you recommend for planting in a homegrown national park type setting on a residential property? Well, in your area, you definitely want to get some oaks in there. Um, anything in the prunus genus is good. Uh, so black cherry, pin cherry, um, willows. 
are just as good. Native willows, highly recommended. But the things that are typically common in your forest are typically the keystone plants. The birches, the, the uh, hickories, walnuts are a little bit farther down there. Tulip tree, I don't know if you have, you have tulip tree that far west. Um, it only supports 21 species where we are. It's a major tree in our forest, but uh, that would never be a, a, a keystone plant. Things like pawpaws, I mean, they're they're great for that zebra swallowtail, but they support almost nothing else. So, um, but that's what that that's what that native plant finders for. Those are ranked lists. Go to the top and start working your way down. We talked before. Debbie was asking about you know making her oak tree into a shrub. Is it too late for her to do this? Does she need to wait till next winter, or can she still do it? Um, no, she can do it now. Yeah. Okay. Shoot. And um, this is a good question from Linda. Her HOA sprays and treats lawns for grubs. Are grubs important to our ecosystem or are they just bad for lawns? That That's a big thing, trying to convince people to not spray for grubs. What yeah. do you... Oh, I think it's a waste of time. Do you have a terrible Japanese beetle problem? Mm -hmm. those are probably the grubs they're they're spraying for mm -hmm. uh, it is okay they're spraying the lawn for the the grubs that are in the lawn correct you know one way to control japanese beetles is have less lawn that's what they eat grass roots <laughs> i don't know that's a lot of a lot of insecticide going down which washes right into our our watershed Exactly. I've never seen Japanese beetle kill a lawn, but if it did, I'd collapse. So that's what the the grackles and the 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 flickers they're poking their bills down there. They're pulling out those those grubs. The June beetles they're all all down there. It's part of the soil ecosystem. Not Japanese beetles, but other forms of scarabs. Well, speaking I, of which, as as I know that 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 we're we could go on forever, but would you leave us some thoughts? We're going to have this huge influx of cicadas mm. in a in a in a month or two. And any any you know knowledge you can share in us about cicadas? This is like a once in a lifetime. This number, I think we have two broods coming out, and uh, we had Sherry who asked if you know if you think it will affect our current attempts at starting natural settings. And, and what do you do with all those carcasses? And we've been telling people maybe wait till fall to plant new trees and shrubs. Don't That's plant good, them That is good advice. I, I planted a big common garden experiment, not this past emergence, but the one before that, 17 years earlier. And the trees were about two, two three feet tall. And I told my grad student, oh, the, the cicadas won't hurt them. I was wrong. They they laid eggs in them and they they really knocked them back. So yeah, if you do plan on putting woodies in the ground this year, wait till fall. Or yeah, wait till fall. You don't want to do it in the middle of the summer. The the cicadas are going to come out in June, um, and then they'll be gone at the end of June. But um, you don't want to plant in July. So wait till fall because they will. It, particularly if they're lacking uh, bigger trees, they will will hit them. And guess what? They like the best. They like oaks the best. Do they really? Okay. We showed that with the last emergence, but otherwise they're, they're fun. The birds will eat a lot of them. Um, birds will switch their diet from, from caterpillars to uh, cicadas because they're big uh, and actually give your, your trees a break or your caterpillars a break because they won't be eating as many. Um, Do you see a higher population of moths and butterflies like the year or the, the year where, where there's a cic big cicada? There's a, a big study in, in D.C. that showed exactly that. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Um, and I just want to share that Sharon said that her skunks and possums eat the grubs in her lawn. That's right. They dig them up. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and possums and possums eat ticks, right? You were talking about ticks earlier? Uh, I, think, I think that's another urban legend, especially deer ticks. They're too tiny. To, I was uh, I was thinking, how do they find them? Yeah, 
you know, sure, a big engorged tick, yeah, possibly eat anything. Are they controlling the ticks? No. Same with guinea hens. You always hear this, get guinea hens and they'll eat all your ticks. No, they won't. Well, you were you were amazing again, as always. We look forward to the next book that you're writing. Um, and everybody, please check out um, the website, Homegrown National Park. And please, oh, please plant native this spring and get on the Homegrown National Park map. Yes. Any final closing thoughts, Lexi, Doug, anybody? Lexi? No. No. Uh, <laughs> I always return to that personal responsibility. It is it is it is your job to take care, care of your piece of the earth. And if you don't want to do it personally, hire somebody who's gonna do it. That's a new industry. And we have some wonderful local native plant landscapers and designers, and you can find them on our website. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you very everybody. much. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, everyone.